Hello and welcome to Health Options. I am Rabi Abdullah. Thanks for joining us on the program. A typical emergency medical system serves three major roles comprising accident prevention and public health awareness, free hospital transport and care, as well as in hospital stabilization and treatment. Available record shows that every year, about 1.2 million people die through road traffic accidents worldwide. Majority of these deaths occur in Africa, where most of the emergency medical system are underdeveloped. A principal purpose of an emergency medical system is to provide timely care to patients with the overall effect of reducing morbidity and mortality. While the design of emergency medical system may vary by country, the underlying aim is the same. Like many developing countries, Nigeria faces significant healthcare challenges, while record shows that significant morbidity and mortality is attributable to lack of a functional emergency medical system. Closing the gaps to meet the response time targets, however, requires substantial investments, which include ambulances, personnel, and other resources. And that's exactly the direction the federal government has just taken through an intervention known as the National Emergency Medical Services and Ambulance System. We have the Minister of Health, Dr. Osage Ehaniri, and the Director of Family Health for the Ministry of Health, Dr. Salma Anas Kolo, joining us on this episode of Health Options to enlighten Nigerians on the importance of the new federal government intervention. You will get to meet them shortly. Watching health options and our focus is the federal government's initiative known as the National Emergency Medical Services and Ambulance System. And right here with me in the studio to throw light on the intervention and its importance is the Minister of Health, Dr. Osagi Ehaniri. Welcome to Health Options, Honorable Minister. Oh, thank you for inviting me. All right. Uh, also with us in the studio is um, Dr. Salma Anas Kolo. She is the Director of Family Health. Federal Ministry of Health. Welcome to Health Options, Dr. Salma. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Yeah. It's a pleasant topic to me if you look at the fact that uh, this has been a yawning gap in the country's uh, healthcare delivery system, emergency uh, medical services, and particularly the initiative we're talking about. Just start by letting Nigerians know what this is all about and what sets it apart from previous close to similar initiatives that we've had that, if you ask me, didn't work. Well, thank you very much. You have used the right word is a yawning gap because if you have a functional primary health care system and secondary health care system and a tertiary health, health care system, you do not have a, a system to address emergencies and the transportation needs of the population, then you do have a yawning gap that is a missing link that uh, uh, completes the value chain of the entire health system. And it is to uh, complete, uh, the, uh, complete that health system that we are now uh, setting up the National Emergency Medical Service, an ambulance system that will cater to the needs of uh, citizens when they are in really in dire distress, both at primary level, secondary and tertiary level, and prevent by providing first aid, providing transportation to a hospital, and providing care at an urgent care center. Okay. Now, what is very important about this is that the entire system has to be paid for. If it is not paid for, then it will not work. Those who are rendering the service... So before we get there, um, I want you to situate what constitute emergencies. We're aware of road accidents, we're aware of women who go into labor and complications set, you know, set forth. Can you just you know, let us into some of those emergency situations? Yes. Uh, the first thought when you speak of emergency is that people think of road accidents. But it's well beyond that because there are emergencies in the domestic setting, 
the emergencies in uh, home settings and in, at the workplace. Uh, uh, women uh, in labor, for example, who are giving birth, of which the majority still give birth at home, uh, can have obstructed labor, they can have heavy bleeding. There are many children who lose their lives due to uh, emergency illnesses at home, pneumonia, diarrhea. And there are also cases of uh, stroke, heart attack, asthma that occur in the homes. And then there are the industrial accidents falling from heights and, and the injuries. So all these contribute, constitute emergency, situ emergency situations where you have to have primary care, uh, first aid, and then transportation to a health facility. Uh, this, that is a missing link in the entire health system. Mm. Dr. Salma, you are the Director of uh, Family Health at the Federal Ministry of Health. And uh, in view of your mandate, your focus, how do you relate it to this new federal government uh, in, uh, intervention? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ravi. It's a great initiative uh, because it will make a huge impact towards saving the lives of women and children. Most of the health problems that occur, occur in women of reproductive age group and mainly are around uh, pregnancy, delivery, and immediately post-delivery. So uh, if you look at the major causes of maternal deaths in Nigeria, which is number one is uh, hemorrhage, bleeding, as rightly mentioned by the Honorable Minister of Health, and then you have hypertensive disorders, which can result in eclampsia leading to convulsions. And then you look at all others, as he mentioned, obstructed labor. These are real emergencies. And you can prevent them almost by almost 100%. With quick intervention, timely intervention, this could be averted. And then when you look at the situation of children also, as he rightly mentioned, pneumonia is a major number one cause of uh, death of children under five years. And so what we have in the ministry, this fits into the new ambulance system where they, uh, we continue to promote every breath counts. Losing a breath, especially of a child under five, results in catastrophic death. Child can die immediately. And this is also associated with others, adolescents, even the adults. So this is a timely intervention that brings it to the doorstep, to the home of, 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 of the family, where it will take care of most of the emergencies that are actually preventable, as I mentioned. Mm. So this is very timely, and uh, it's a welcome development, and uh, it's a step that will really uh, avert unnecessary and unacceptable maternal death and also uh, uh, some improved survival of children, especially under five years. Very well. Honorable Minister, I would uh, like you to, you know, talk about something quite critical here. It's an initiative that no doubt requires <coughs> a lot of investment, talking about funding, talking about, we're talking about ambulances, personnel, and synergy. Is there a solely federal government thing, or you have some sort of partnership with the private sector? Yes, uh, the uh, National Health Act and uh, sets aside 1% uh, of consolidated federal revenue for uh, basic health care. And out of that, 5% uh, is set for emergency medical treatment. Now, that uh, amount definitely is not going to be enough um, to provide all the services of emergency medical care. Uh, uh, as you know, for a nation of our size, 200 million, and all the expanse of emergencies that occur, uh, you need a lot more resources than that. So we have looked at how to make the best use of these resources. First, by growing it, we are going to have to be working uh, with uh, organizations that can contribute to that amount. We are also going to be looking at using all the assets available for healthcare. You spoke about ambulances just now. We have to be able to bring in all the ambulances from the private sector, uh, use hospitals also of the private sector, along with uh, government-owned hospitals and government-owned ambulances. And that means an innovative collaboration and cooperation between the private health sector and the uh, public health sector. Now, the Section 18 of the National Health Act uh, allows the, uh, the uh, minister to create a public and private cooperation of that nature to solve related problems in the health sector. And that is what we have done by creating the Emergency Medical Committee, which is already inaugurated by National Council on Health, uh, brings together all the assets and 
expertise of the private sector and the public sector to solve a, public, a problem that has bedeviled the health system for a long time. So it is a public service that is going to be rendered with that and should be nationwide and to improve the indices of our country. Okay, let, let's take a look at the personnel involved now, you know, because it can't be a solely Federal Ministry of Health uh, personnel thing. You know, in fact, the thought you know, in my head has to do, you know, readily I, I thought of uh, road safety, I, I thought of uh, even the police and other security agents. You, because you have a situation in the, in, the, in the case of an accident, for instance, you know, where there has to be a demand for a uh, police report for may, maybe an accident victim or even a victim of a bullet wound and all of that. And I know that we have this, you know, policy that says treat victims, you know, of emergency cases, but that seemed not to have worked to our, you know, it has really not yielded the desired result. So what's different this time around? How are you going to make that work? Yes, uh, there are two main initiatives there. The first is that uh, the committee is all-encompassing. Uh, there are 31 groups in the emergency medical committee, and the chair is from the private sector, the secretary is from the Ministry of Health, and it involves groups like the police, uh, the Federal Road Safety, you just mentioned, one of the most important members because uh, not only do they uh, regulate use of the road, they also respond to accidents and they are very greatly involved in accident prevention. It involves the fire services, in fire it in, in involves uh, blood transition and uh, a commission. And uh, it also involves uh, National Union of Road Transport Workers and uh, all those who use the roads, uh, transport uh, fleet owners and so on, and even insurance groups. So a lot of interest groups are represented uh, who play a role, who are stakeholders in providing emerg emergency service to all uh, Nigerians in all conditions. Now the second problem is a question of payment for service. Very many times uh, when persons are brought into a hospital, they are left unattended to because uh, the hospital does not uh, have a way of recovering their uh, expenditure. So the uh, committee will be responsible for assuring payment to accredited hospitals where emergency cases are brought in. They will assure payment for ambulance service to the uh, hospital an assured payment for the first aid that is uh, rendered. So once you have an assurance of payment for service according to a tariff that's worked out, then there is no more uh, fear of, of, or apprehension at the hospital that they will use their resources to uh, resuscitate somebody. I will never be paid because the patient actually has no money. And there are those who actually have money and the, uh, the time of emergency uh, there's no money on them and they might in fact be unconscious and we have seen cases where people have lost their lives because there was hesitation in uh, giving them treatment uh, when the uh, hospital or the private facility thought that they would now be uh, re reimbursed. So to, it is to uh, remove that uh, hazard that we assure all accredited members of the this, of this system that they will be paid for the emergency service uh, at least within 48 hours of uh, seeing a patient. And uh, including blood transfusion, all of it will be paid for to make sure that a life is saved. And uh, with this initiative, we believe that you can save more than 50% of the fatalities and perhaps the mortalities across the entire uh, uh, system value chain of emergencies. Okay. Dr. Salma. I know that um, when it comes to family settings, especially mm -hmm. in the rural areas, we still have our cultural barriers, you know, especially when it has to do with uh, women. Mm -hmm. For instance, if a woman is in a critical condition, you know, maybe she's in labor in her home and the consent of the family for the intervention that you are making available, you know, is, is being put to question. Yeah. How do you intend to resolve all of that? Yes, so uh, I think this also, uh, the ambulance system will help to resolve that because it's one of the major delays. When we talk about maternal mortality and child, what major foil is around three delays. So delay, as you rightly mentioned, in taking decision to take the woman to the facility to access uh, emergency services. It has to be taken by a totality of a family. And some, some of the reasons are because of cost. And then secondly, because of transportation. 
So how this will resolve is because with a call, you can call an ambulance, and the ambulance, ambulance will be at the home. So as they are picking, at the pickup point, they are also rendering services. They are providing emergency services because it is a well-equipped ambulance that will have the basic needs that will provide emergency services. So if a woman is called and then she is in labor or she is having bleeding as a result of maybe postpartum hemorrhage, so imme the immediate care is administered there. Blood will be transfused, as the minister mentioned. Blood transfusion is a critical component of it. So by just administering blood, you have saved the life of the mother. Okay. And then the woman is transported to the facility mm. where services will continue. Okay. So if you take the same example of a child that is in respiratory distress, Ambulance is there to provide immediate oxygen as they are picking up the child. They are also administering the first aid emergency services. So what changes? The game changer is the timely intervention. And it has also removed barriers. Barriers in decision making, barriers in transportation, and barriers in access to emergency services within the facility. Okay, the, the aspect of communication is, uh, is critical here. Is there going to be a toll free line dedicated to that? Because if uh, one has to call ambulance services, and I mean, who is taking responsibility? Yeah, thank you very much. That is very important. You are correct. We have been working with the National Communication Commission. The very important part of this committee, I said that there are 31 members of the committee and the National Communication Commission is one of them. They have provided uh, the number 112 as an emergency, which will be made uh, very public and as I believe also with this program made public that the uh, national distress number is 112. The Federal Road Safety also has been operating the national distress number, which is 122. And uh, it is to attend to uh, issues that have to do with uh, distress in on the road uh, in their own uh, purview, area of purview. So both of these numbers actually now go to a call center, a dispatch center, where they are disaggregated either to police call for criminal activities or fire, uh, in case it is a fire, but also to medical in case there's a medical emergency. And it is from there that the nearest ambulance will be contacted and uh, sent to the scene. We are also working with the same, with uh, one of the agencies of government for uh, geolocation. The Federal Road Safety is working with us in that. Once you know the address, you can geolocate it and guide the ambulance to that area of service. Uh, we discussed this yesterday with the Federal Road Safety Commission uh, to uh, work with the NIPOST uh, on, 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 the, on, on, on geolocation that will guide the ambulance driver, whether by day or night, to the site where there is need, and then to, uh, and the ambulance driver and the technician on board will be able to take the patient to an accredited hospital. So you are not going from one hospital to the other looking for help. Uh, they already have contact, and by the time the ambulance arrives, uh, the hospital is already alerted and waiting. So all this saves time because in an emergency, Time is critical. Mm. Uh, the expertise is also critical, and and, uh, and and personnel on ground materials are critical. But time is of great essence because a few minutes delay can cause the loss of a life. Uh, uh, so we're going to be doing some uh, time management to know the response time and know the time that uh, it takes to provide the service in order to be able to continue improving on services. Okay, let's know the direction is taken. Is it from uh, uh, bottom to uh, bottom up or up down? Because I know like in the rural areas for instance, you know, do you have, is it, a, is it a, um, the same one, one size fit all thing you want to do for the urban setting or, and the rural areas now? I, I really need to know. For instance, if you have um, facilities that have been earmarked or have been approved for this initiative. How, how do you link them? Talking about urban and rural setting now. Yes, uh, we are not going to be differentiating so much uh, urban or rural settings except in looking at the type of uh, uh, um, ambulance or vehicle that you want to use because you are going to have to be working with both four-wheel and also three-wheel ambulances which will be able to manu uh, maneuver into uh, tight settings. But uh, generally, it is uh, going to be 
the a situation where the committee actually buys service in that it's not going to buy itself operate or buy operate vehicles or buy vehicles but we use and pay uh, more like the uber system that you know so we have already received inquiries of persons who want to bring in ambulances to be used for this purpose thank you so much honorable minister for making our time to join us on health options thank you very much for inviting us thank you also dr salomon for being with us on thank the program you. thank you uh, that concludes this episode of health options make safety your watchword a quick reminder also that you can go to our youtube channel to watch the uploads of these and other episodes of the program Email us for your comments and contributions at healthoptions at nta.gov.ng. My name is Rabi Abdullah. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again. You can follow us on all our social media platforms. Facebook at NTA Network News. Instagram at NTA Network. Twitter at NTA News Now. YouTube at NTA News Online. Or visit www.nta.ng. For live streaming, visit www.nta.ng slash live. Now, you can stay updated on the go. Be it on your TV, iPhone, laptop, or iPad, or download the NTA mobile application from your Play Store or App Store. NTA, you can't beat the rich. <laughs> The industry in Kano is as old as the beginning of the Hausa civilization. Spanning over a thousand of years, the industry supplied leather materials to the hinterland and also served as a major trade link between Kano and other parts of the world through transparent trade. It flourished for many years and served as an essential economic mainstay of the Hausa land. In Kano today, Few tanneries struggle to operate at a capacity quite inadequate to feed the local leather industries. And this has no doubt stunted their growth, not only in Kano, but other parts of Nigeria. This is Majema local leather industry or traditional leather industry in Kofar Wambai area of the city of Kano. This place is believed to have existed 